My guest today is Dr. Jennifer Stelter, a Johns Hopkins author, clinical psychologist, dementia care expert, and creator of the Dementia Connection model. Dr. Stelter, it's a pleasure to talk with you. I've, I've, I've dog-eared your book. It's really <laughs> important for family caregivers, and I thank you. I thank you for having written it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I also love the title, The Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advanced Alzheimer's Disease. I think that's all of us. That's every, every caregiver, especially a Alzheimer's caregiver, is busy. So it really, mm -hmm. really touched a nerve. You, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Can you describe your dementia connection model and how it affects and could support uh, family caregivers with loved ones living with Alzheimer's? Absolutely. So the model itself was created really over a, a 10 year period of working alongside uh, staff and caregivers who were taking care of those living with dementia. And it, it took a, it was a lot of research put into it as well as again, uh, practice, right? So working with those living with dementia hands on. And, you know, through that 10 year period, I was able to really kind of establish a model of care that would really meet uh, caregivers, both professional and family caregivers, you know, where they're at. Um, it's really broken up into three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is the three theory of retrogenesis. The second pillar is the act of habilitation. And the third is the actual tool itself or the approach you're going to use, which is sensory stimulation, right? Or what we take in, which is called sensory-based knowledge, okay? So the first pillar was really designed as a way to understand what's going on as the disease progresses. You know, the reason I felt this was imperative to a model of care is because in working in the industry, I just was astounded of how, what people did not know about this disease. And when talking to nurses and uh, certified nursing assistants, CNAs, um, have worked with so many over the year, just awesome, awesome folks. Um, they have, you know, they, they tell me, Dr. Stelter, I never got trained in this in school. This wasn't a part of our curriculum. And nurses would say, well, maybe there was a chapter on it, but there was really no focus on this. And I was just amazed by that, where when they come to work in senior living or a hospital, right, that organization is required to provide that training from, you know, nothing to something. And so the nurse may be starting their shift, right, starting their first time on their first shift, and they're working with someone living with dementia with absolutely no training, which is absurd. Or they may have gotten a few maybe online classes that during their orientation they were required to have, right? But that's not enough, right? And so for myself, I said, there's got to be a better way because yes, we know that they're you know losing abilities, they can't do what they used to do, but there, it's so much more than that. So when we talk about the theory of retrogenesis, it's really about us placing ourselves in that person's shoes to know what they can still do, right? So the theory was actually developed by Dr. Barry Reisberg of his years of research. So not something that I did, but something that I felt was imperative people know about, because when you ask people, do you know about this theory? They're like, I've never heard about it before. And in his, in his theory, what he found, or in his research, what he found is that people living with dementia as the disease progresses they're actually moving towards an earlier developmental stage in their life, okay? Um, he actually pinpointed that those in the moderate to late stage show signs of someone who is age seven years old to four weeks old, okay? So let's think about that, right? You are working with or you're caring for your mom, right? Maybe they're around 85 years old, but they may have the skill ability of a five-year-old, of a two-year-old, right? And when you think about it like that, right, picture a five-year-old, picture a two-year-old, right? Yes, there's many things that they can't do, right? We know that, but there are things that they can do and they need a lot of reinforcement. They need a lot of support. They need a lot of modeling, right? And in the first five years of life, how adolescents learn is they learn through their senses, right? They pick up everything, how to walk, talk, eat, Everything that they do, they learn from what they see and what they hear, what they touch, smell, all of that, right? I mean, 
think about like a two-year-old, a two-year-old's not picking up a book and saying, hmm, this is how I go to the bathroom. Like they're not doing that. It's all based on the person who's caring for them, usually parents, showing them and praising them and supporting them, right? So because we know they're going back to an earlier state, we have to know what is their new world and the new world is gonna be focused primarily on their senses, right? So that's an ability that they have, right? And we do know that there are some, you know, senses maybe compromised a little bit, but regardless, they still have those abilities to take in the information into their brain, right? And we'll get to that in a second. Right. The other thing that they have is, although compromised again, is the ability to feel emotions. And we, we know that they can still feel emotions for a very long time because in the beginning of the disease, we see some personality changes, but we start to see them act out their feelings through their behaviors, right? They show us how they feel. Again, very similar to how adolescents express themselves. Adolescents, you know, when they're one and two years old, three years old, they don't say, I'm sad, right? They don't say that. They show you that they're sad, right? Through their facial expressions, tears, you know, then we pick up as the caregivers or parent, we say, they must be sad, something's wrong, right? And so we do know that they're feeling emotions, right? So the, the trick here there is to understand, right? where the person living with dementia is going, right? We've got to understand that. And for the caregiver, and why again, I put this theory in for another reason is because it allows that person to lower their frustrations about this, right? You're not working with an 85 year old adult who has all these abilities. You are working with a, a potentially someone at a developmentally younger age, right? And it allows you to accept accept that this is where it is, right? And it, it's not easy to get there, I get it, but it allows you to understand like, this is not what the person wants, the person living with dementia. They didn't ask for this, right? But it's happening. And the sooner that the caregiver can accept that they're younger than they really are, then we can move forward with a real true connection, right? So there's that piece, right? To help not only course the person living with dementia that we understand them better, but it helps the caregiver to come to a place of acceptance, right? So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is the active habilitation. This is just like how you're gonna do it. So the first one is the why, second one, how, right? You are going to use the act of sensory stimulation or using sensory stimulation over and over and over again, right? This is gonna be a daily structured thing, okay? So whatever you do in the morning, you're gonna do the same. When you do in the afternoon, same, Af you know, evening, same, right? they really thrive on structure and consistency. Again, very similar to how adolescents do well, right? Adolescents have to be in a structure consistent environment, right? And so same thing people with living with dementia. So we'll, we'll get to that, you know, we'll come back to that part. The third pillar is the actual approach, which is you're gonna use sensory stimulation, okay? Because you know they're taking in everything through their senses and that's how they're really learning now. That's how they're navigating. That's how they're communicating. That's how they're connecting is through their senses, just like how adolescents do very young in life, okay? So when we are presenting sensory, sensory stimulation, this is what's happening. And this is why my model is considered a cognitive behavioral type of therapy in that when we take in information through our senses, whether that's our nose or eyes or ears, you know, fingers, whatever it might be, right? it is actually directly or indirectly influencing our limbic system of our brain. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little clinical here, right? Our limbic system is somewhat in the uh, middle part of our brain and it houses two very important organs, our amygdala, which generates emotions and our hippocampus, which generates um, memories, right? So when we take in information through our senses, it's gonna influence how we feel, it's gonna influence our memories, okay? And so, and that's why children very early on can form memories, but they form them based on their experiences and what they're, uh, what they're taking in through their senses, right? That's how they're able to remember, how do I use the restroom? How do I feed myself, right? It becomes what's called procedural memory in essence, okay? And so in that respect, when we use sensory stimuli, we want, of course, that to be, to always be positive, right? What does the person like to hear? Like, so if it's music, what kind of music do they like? If it's food, what kind of food do they like, right? If it smells, what are their favorite smells, right? So, and so on and so forth, right? Um, we want to remove the negative stimuli and introduce positive stimuli as much as possible, right? And so when we go through the day, going back to habilitation, right? Whatever stimuli you're presenting, you want to present that same stimuli at the same time every day, because two things are going to happen. One, they're going to get the immediate effect 
right? Because it is going to directly or indirectly influence the limbic system, right? That's one. But long-term, what I found in my research is after about four weeks, we start to see them actually picking up on those cues and understanding what you want from them, what they should be doing, what time of day it is, right? Which leads them to be more independent, right? And that's the goal, right? So in that respects, being able to do this consistently using habilitation, they can learn over a four week period what's going on, right? Um, and again, it's not gonna be completely fine tuned just like with adolescents, they don't always know, but they start to really pick up on these things of what's important, what they should be doing. Right. And so that that really does help the person to stay as independent for as long as possible. Um, so that's really the uh, dementia connection model in a nutshell uh, with those with those three pillars. So it, it's kind of like a why, a how and a what all in one. What I love about it is that um, we've always said that the challenge as uh, Alzheimer's caregiver is that really not that same person that led your family yeah. that you know, it's, you always came to for advice, had a business um, that looks like that person, but what's going on is, is inside is different. And to be able to go inside their mind and their emotions and be able to um, help move them to where you want them to be. Now, we've always said that, but I've never seen a structure for it before. And I yeah. think this is, this is really important for any family caregiver dealing with Alzheimer's um, to learn that mm -hmm. that's not the same person that you knew, but also there's a structure and a model that mm -hmm. you can put together that can help you come to a place where it's better for you and better for them. Right. And the other piece of this too is, is you bring up a really good point is, you know, often I hear family caregivers say, it's just, she's, it's not, it's not my mom, right? I, I don't know who she is. I don't know how to, what to say to her, what to do with her. Right. And, and of course, they're mourning that loss, but we need to move to how you can connect or reconnect back yeah. to her. And so what's great about the model is the person who's receiving the positive stimuli, right, right, which is that person living with dementia, they start to associate that positive experience with the person giving it to them, which would be you, the caregiver. Right. So when over time, when they learn, like, you're a person I like to be around, you give me all this good stuff. Right. They want to be around you more. They have more positive experiences with you. In turn, you have more positive experiences with them and that connects you guys together. And that's why I called it the dementia connection model because it's a model on how to connect or reconnect to that person. And we can do it, it there's clinical science behind it, but there's also just really a, an understanding of what the person's going through. So having that all together really makes that connection. I, I also believe, see, I, I dog-eared it. I also believe that this is should be seen as a workbook because yes. you have, yes. you know, you have uh, workbook elements mm -hmm. to it, and yes. I think where you start. The reason that I was so taken with this book is from the beginning is you start from the basics of what is Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. We host a series of conferences and have for twenty five years across the the country, um, and a significant portion of our uh, uh, our attendees are Alzheimer's caregivers. And whenever we have a, a, a doctor or care manager on the uh, Q&A panel, the question always comes up is what is Alzheimer's? How is it different from dementia? Right. What are we talking about? People don't, we are the CEOs of caring for a loved one. We are in charge, mm -hmm. but people don't give us the tools we need so many times. Mm -hmm. And that it's right where you started. What is Alzheimer's disease is it sounds so simple, but it's, I think it's the, the building block for being able to um, process your role as a family caregiver. So mm -hmm. I, I like that. I like that very much. What is your elevator speech for a family caregiver when they say, what is that? What is Alzheimer's? What is dementia? What, what am I dealing with here? Right. Yeah. And so when we talk about um, just dimension of itself, right, it's really a broad range of symptom, which is a loss of mental functioning. And there's different things in there like judgment and orientation and language and communication, right? Those things are unfortunately are decompensating over time. And when we talk about Alzheimer's disease specifically. So Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. OK, 
Okay. So think of dementia as like an umbrella yes. term that describes many different types of dementias. I and mean, if you think about it, there's actually over 100 different types of dementias, right? Alzheimer's disease is just one type. Okay. It is the most common, about 66% of people who have dementia have Alzheimer's disease, you know, and sometimes there's mixed too, but nonetheless, what it is basically Alzheimer's is that we're, I always say there's two main changes happening to the brain. Just keep it simple, right? There are these uh, plaques and tangles forming in the brain, which are called protein deposits. And what's happening is that the brain, we all have protein that comes in our brain, but we, our brain usually breaks it up. Okay. With Alzheimer's disease, the brain cannot break it up. So it clumps together and where it clumps together is where it starts to deteriorate that part of the brain. Okay. Now there's of course, wonderful research out there with medication, trying to one, break up the protein, right. And of course, avoid that clumping altogether. Right. So we're, we're there, we're, we're getting there, right. With a lot of research. The other thing that's happening to the brain is we all have a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and acetylcholine is responsible for letting our left and right hemispheres talk to each other. And what happens is, is that um, level of neurotransmitter decreases. So eventually the left and right hemispheres don't talk together, right? So we're having these um, kind of protein deposits um, dying off or killing off parts of the brain. At the same time, the hemispheres aren't speaking together. And we need the whole brain to work in order for our body to function. And what's key here is a lot of people think, oh, well, they'll lose a lot of physical abilities, right? Like they can't take care of themselves anymore, right? Um, all the way from managing their money all the way through brushing their teeth, right? Um, and of course, people know that they're losing their ability to remember things, right? But there's so much more than that. They're losing the ability to cope with their emotions, they're losing their ability to um, be able to plan and organize what's going on in their daily life. They're having uh, difficulty anticipating what comes next in a simple sequence, like how do I brush my teeth again, right? Or how do I anticipate risks, right? Do I remember that I'm not supposed to put aluminum into microwaves, right? Because does a two-year-old know that? They don't, right? Um, so these are things, everything's going in reverse. So it's not just a physical or a, you know, kind of, uh, memory kind of disorder. There's, there's more to that, but just remember those two main changes. That's what's going on. Again, things that happen to them that they don't really have control over. Right. I mean, we talk about brain health and that's a whole nother thing we can talk about at some point yeah. with trying to help lower your risk, but when it's there, it's there. Right. And so we have to understand what's happening to that brain. And, and I want to tell you the weight that comes off a caregiver's shoulder, and I'm sure uh, caregivers who are watching uh, your, your, this sex, this section of, of the video, the same thing will happen when they understand the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia, the umbrella, there's a hundred types. Oh, you know, that, that respect to be given to the family caregiver that you're giving yeah. makes for a great partnership between the medical community and the family member, because they now understand the baseline of what life they're living with going forward. Right, right, absolutely. And that was my hope too, is just to be able to help the, have this resonate with folks, right? And be able to connect with them at their level. Um, you know, a lot of feedback that I'm getting, you know, around the book is easy to read, right? And, yeah, and more is. so just, you know, people have said, you know, you explain it in such a way that's just easy to relate to, you know? And so I really hope that I can do that for more people as, as I continue to spread the word of what we're doing at our Institute and things like that, so. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, tell me what you offer through the Dementia Connection Institute. Absolutely. So we just opened in January. I'm so excited about it. My business partner, I have a business partner. Her name is Jessica Ryan and she's a biologist. So we put our my psychology mind and her biology mind together and we developed the Institute. And so right. I took what I had done for years and put it into an entity where we can serve folks um, both for family uh, caregivers and professional caregivers. So we're the first institute to serve both kinds of caregivers, which we're really proud about um, because I think it serves, dementia serves no bounds. It doesn't matter about your degree. It doesn't matter about your experience. It matters about who you're working with or who you are treating. And we're all on the same playing field with that. So, um, so our services we offer, we do a lot of um, one hour educations. Um, so we do professional educations. If you know folks need continuing education, um, of course, all kinds of topics related to dementia care. 
Um, sometimes we um, present for organizations and they um, want us to market. And so we, we present on that realm too. So sometimes for education, sometimes for marketing. Um, but we actually just came out this summer with our two certification programs. Um, one is uh, people can become dementia connection specialists, so DCSs. And the other is dementia connection specialist certified trainer, so DCSCT. Great. So the, the DCS certification is for both caregivers, okay, both family and professional. Again, because I say this, people say like, well, how can you certify a family caregiver who doesn't have all this experience and, and education? I say, because the model wasn't built for a degree. The model was built really because people with dementia don't care about your degree or your title or your experience. They care about how they feel with you. So this is a, this is a certification in connecting yeah. and learning more about a deeper dive into that dementia connection model and how to apply it across the symptoms. So anywhere from each ADL to you know, behavioral concerns that you may have faced, right? How do you manage all of those? So that's what the certification is. It's a seven hour program. And if you are a healthcare professional, you get six CEs, which is great. It's all built into one. The trainer program is for healthcare professionals who've been in the industry where we need a team to help us spread the love of education and support. So Jessica and I, it's just, we're a two man band here. Um, we do have a, an awesome you know, PR marketing person with us too, but you know, in terms of the clinical side of it, we're the two folks. And so we do need a team of people to help us train. So, um, so that certification is um, an eight hour program and seven CEs offered, um, but then they, these folks can go out and conduct the training and earn some extra cash but also most importantly, spread that love of, of dementia education. So those came out in the summer. We did a um, soft launch. And then in September here, we are um, live. People can sign up for these courses. We have um, seminar dates scheduled through the end of the year. Um, so you can see that one of our services is heavy duty on education and training. Um, another service that we provide is we do consultation. Um, so myself, I will go into organizations and I will help if they are looking to develop their dementia programming. Uh, but I also offer private services to family caregivers. So we will meet one-on-one -on -one in sessions and we will guide based on what you need, you know, so helping you through this process, getting you your resources, giving you a place to vent and process. I mean, I am a clinical psychologist by trade, so um, I have done hours and hours and tons of therapy in my past. And so that's kind of a nice hat to wear with some of those fam family caregivers who really need it. Um, and so we do the consultation. And then uh, last, we do a lot of... Um, um, publications and blogging, podcasts, you know, those kinds of things. So uh, we haven't yet put those on our website. Um, our PR person is kind of putting that all together because we've done a ton this year. So we want to be able to offer a resource library to folks on our website. So soon to come there. But if people go to our website at DementiaConnectionInstitute.org, they can get on our mailing list and stay tuned to all the things we have to offer this year. And, and we hope to further develop it out here in 2024. Excellent. Well, one more question is, how do people get the busy caregivers guide the book yeah so um we it's offered in in three entities they can go to uh, johns hopkins press website it's there uh they can also go to amazon or they can go to barnes and noble um and it's all there it's available actually on paperback digital um, i actually did the recording myself which is wonderful to be able to have that honor of being able to read my own book um, so it is in digital where they can do audiobook um, and then it's also hard copy. And also we're quite thrilled and quite proud that the book is um, on uh, the caregiver.com um, caregiver book club. So if people come to caregiver.com or see it through the, today's caregiver magazine, they can reach you through the caregiver book club as well. So thank you. A lot of ways for people to get the book and a lot of reasons for people to get the book. And I thank you for everything that you do for family caregivers of people living with Alzheimer's.